Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to I-Town. It's good to have you in the house today. When we sing words like, I plead the blood, if you're new to this whole Christian deal, all we're simply saying is that we put our faith in Jesus and not in anything else. We don't believe in a 51% heaven because that's not what the Bible teaches. You can't earn your way to God. There is no such thing as a good person. The Bible tells us every one of us falls short of God's standard. Every one of us deserve death. And the penalty for sin is that separation eternally from God, death. But praise God that the gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen, everybody? The best gift we could possibly receive. I love this verse in Romans chapter 5. It says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us. What an amazing thought. You see, it goes on to make this point that most people would, would not be willing to die for an upright person, though there might be somebody, some extraordinary person that would die for someone who's especially good. But that's not what Jesus did. He died for us, showing his great love because he died while we were still sinners. And I think we need to pause from time to time to let that really sink in of what Jesus did for us while there was no hope that we would respond, while there was no chance, no guarantee that we would say yes. He died for us when we were at war with God in our minds, when we were lost in our sin, when there was nothing that we could do to connect with God. He came searching for us and he died in our place. So we turn our attention this Palm Sunday to Holy Week and the sacrifice of Jesus. I think it's important for us to remember that there's not a person in this church that could ever earn our way to God. Not one of us is good enough. And so today we say thank you, God, for the blood. Thank you, Jesus, for his sacrifice. Thank you for seeing value in us, for rescuing us, for dying for us. When we plead the blood, we're just saying, God, I'll never be enough. I can't do this on my own, but thank God. It's the blood that draws us close. It's his blood that sets us free. It's his blood that puts us in the place that we need to be to live this life that we only dream of. Apart from the presence and the power of God, would you open your hearts to him for one more moment today? Lord Jesus, we thank you for how good you are. God, you're better to us than we deserve. We pause today to recognize the sacrifice of Jesus and the necessity of it. God, we were at war with you in our minds. We were lost in our sinful depravity with no hope. And yet you came at the perfect time when you would die the most brutal and gruesome, painful death in human history. You suffered for us so that today we could experience life. That's what we pray over every person in this place. We speak life over every heart, over every mind, over every marriage, over every child. One more time, we say thank you that your blood washes us white as snow. Let's sing that together. Sing it again, oh the blood.
Don't you love him today? Lift him up. Jesus, we thank you that you made the first move. We remember today that we were lost, hopelessly broken, and that you came searching for us. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you today for your blood. And we pleaded over our families today, over our marriages, over our minds, our hearts, our calling. God, we declare our complete dependency upon you. As scripture says, it's in you we live and move and have our being. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're in this place today. We pray that you would lead us to the truth that sets us free. We thank you for this book. We thank you that the word is alive. We pray today that you would bring us revelation that would transform our perspective of ourselves and the world around us. And God, we pray that you would help us to leave here changed because you are in this place. We love you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. The prophet prophesied, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. Yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. I want you to turn to your neighbor at all of our campuses and tell him it's time to be a good donkey. Come on, tell him it's time to be a good donkey. Turn to the other neighbor and tell him you need this message. This is for you. You grab your seats at all of our campuses. Welcome to I-Town. What an honor it is to have you in the house of the Lord today. If you brought your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 19. If you did not, you can grab your cell phone or something to take some notes with. And as you settle in, get ready to study the word. I want to say hello to our church family meeting at other campuses. We love you so very much. Those of you who are joining us online, and then, of course, the correctional facilities all across the state. Come on, church, can you put your hands together? Welcome all of our guests, all of our church. So great to have you with us, all of you, in additional seating here at Olson Farms. It is exciting. Happy Palm Sunday, everybody. This is the beginning of what we call Holy Week, as we begin to think about and celebrate the events of the last week of Jesus' life, culminating, of course, with Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. I'm excited to study the Word today. It's great to be back. I've been traveling, actually, and speaking. I don't do a ton of that, but it's been kind of busy the last couple of weeks. Two weekends ago, I was with Pastor Marcus Meekham and Seven Hills Church in Cincinnati. They're growing four campuses now, thousands of people. It's amazing to see what God is doing. Then I slipped up to Chicago for City Church. They're having revival nights, and they're in the middle of a building project there in downtown Chicago. First church building in 30 years being built from the ground up. Praise God for that. Come on, somebody give God praise. It's amazing. God's moving in incredible ways. And then last weekend, I had the chance to be at City Reach Church in Austin, Texas, 
Pastor Chris Gilkey is a dear friend. He was here this last year for our revival services, and uh, they are really seeing God move in supernatural ways. They've already seen 1,600 people come to faith in Christ this year alone, exploding at the seams. God's moving. They're in the middle of a building project. So praise God. The body of Christ is alive and well and moving, taking ground. It's fun to be a part of the winning team. Amen, everybody? It's good to be back. Hopefully you are enjoying Palm Sunday and all the events that are coming up. We have a lot of special services because we know how y'all are and they just, the devil plans spring break over Easter and then all y'all go worship the wrong sun. You travel to the south and you worship online and it's just not the same. So this year we have a Thursday night service, 7 p.m., Easter service, and I know you're thinking, but that's not even like Good Friday. It's not even dead. There's nothing happening yet. It's like this way too early. Trust me, it happened thousands of years ago. God will still be able to celebrate resurrection on Thursday night. So we have Thursday night, 7 p.m., Friday night, 7 p.m., Saturday night, 7 p.m., and then for all of you who believe that the Holy Spirit only moves on Sunday, we have 9, 11, and 1 still on Sunday here at Olson. Of course, Bluffton and Mudsock will both be at 9 and 11, our normal times, and I'm excited. I believe God's going to move. All of the services will be identical. I'll be preaching every one of them here at Olson Farms, and we are very excited about it. And I have a message for you out of this passage in Luke chapter 19, uh, specifically for Palm Sunday as we prepare for Easter. Uh, This account, as Jesus is heading into Jerusalem to prepare for his final week, as we call it, Palm Sunday, this account shows up in all four Gospels. We find it in Luke 19, Matthew 21, Mark 11, John 12. And today we're going to study the account predominantly out of Luke chapter 19. But it's amazing how there's little details that we pick up in each one of the Gospels. Of course, Jesus' focus at this point of his life is just the cross. He spent a couple of chapters before this in nearly every gospel trying to prepare his disciples for the events that are about to unfold and the things that are going to happen. He's about to give his life for humanity, dying in our place to pay the price for sin. And that weight had to have been such a crushing weight. And I love the story. Pick it up in verse 28. Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. Now, He's had many conversations with them, trying to help them understand what's going to happen and the fact that he was going to die. Of course, they're not fully understanding. They're nervous about the outcome. In fact, if we study the account in Mark chapter 10, the Bible tells us that people amongst his group, even the disciples, they're afraid, they're apprehensive about what is going to happen when they get to Jerusalem and the things that Jesus has tried to tell them about. And so they're a little bit nervous as they're following him. And Jesus, of course sets his face like a flint, the Bible says, to Jerusalem. He's walking with this authority and this confidence. He knows what's waiting for him. And as a true leader, he's kind of setting the pace. He's out in front. And uh, I always laugh at that scripture because, uh, you know, we have six kids and I love every one of them, but they're pretty strong-willed. And most of them will probably, if not all of them, grow up to be leaders in their own right. But when we're out in public or like we're going on vacation, we're walking places, I always say, hey, guys, I can't lead you if you're ahead of me. Because they're always like, they're some rolls, man. They know what's going on. They're making decisions for everybody. They're out there walking. And they don't, we're like, hey, we're going this way. We're turning. I was with Thunder just the other day in Lowe's. And I was like, buddy, we ain't going down that aisle. You got to stop. You slow down. Slow your roll. Come hold my hand. Follow daddy. I think sometimes it's a good reminder. Let Jesus take the lead, and he knows what he's doing. He knows where he's going. Verse 29, as he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. And as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. Now, he comes to these cities, the, the, the cities of Bethpage and Bethany. They're probably about two miles outside of Jerusalem, in, in ancient Jerusalem. And, of course, the city of Bethany is where Lazarus, his good friend, lived with his sisters Mary and Martha. It's a place that Jesus stopped pretty often on his pilgrimages to Jerusalem. And so this is a place that was pretty uh, uh, 
you know, familiar for him to pass through. He'd been here many different times. But this particular time, he tells his disciples, I want you to go into town, and when you get there, you're going to find this brand new donkey. Nobody's ever ridden it. It's a brand new car, and nobody's ever driven it before, and it's just going to be parked there, and I want you to jack it. I want you to steal it. <laughs> Bring it to me because I need it. Like, I just, I don't know, I say this all the time, but if you don't find humor in Scripture, I just don't think you're reading the Bible right because... I think this is pretty hilarious. He's like, he's, te- he's prophetically telling them, you're going to go into this city and you're going to find this donkey. And, and when you get it, you're going to untie it and then just tell anybody that asks you what you're doing that the Lord needs it. And so I think it's fascinating the level of detail prophetically Jesus is giving them of what they're going to see, who they're going to encounter, what they'll need to say. It's like really kind of mind blowing if you really think about it. And then I love that Jesus, Jesus was the first Jedi. You probably didn't know that until they ruined Star Wars. It used to be cool. But G, G, he just said, the Lord needs it. Like, the Lord needs it. Oh, the Lord needs it. We'll give you the, like, it just it didn't really make any sense. But I made a decision because I don't know if you're new to Itown. We have this series that we like to do most years following Easter called Zero to Sixty. And we bring cars out on the stage and we talk about them and, and, and preach the gospel out of the vehicles. We're going to do it again this year. And so I'm excited about that right after Easter, we'll be in zero to 60 again. But to prepare for that series, I think I'm just going to go around town and start stealing really nice cars. And when people stop me, I'll just be like, the Lord needs it. I don't know if it'll work. So if I end up in jail, y'all will know what happened. And so these are the instructions he gives. In verse 32, the story goes on. So they went and they found the colt just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, hey, what are you doing? Why are you stealing our donkey? And the disciples replied, the Lord needs it. So pause again for a minute because there's so much humor here. Like there, so we don't know which two disciples. I think it would have been funny if somebody would have told us. But just two guys get chosen randomly and they go to town and they're like, do you think we're gonna see a donkey? I don't know if we'll see a donkey. And they're like, look, it's right there. Like, is anybody looking? I don't know if anybody's looking. You untie it. No, you untie it. Like, all right, fine. So they go up and they're kind of like messing with it. They're like, dude, somebody's they're walking this way. They're coming. They're looking at us. They're looking right at us. They're going to talk to us. What are they doing? Are they going to, oh my gosh, we're going to get in so much trouble. We're totally going to jail. We're stealing a donkey. And he's like, you tell him. No, you tell him. I'll tell him. Okay. So the guy's like, what are you doing? And the Lord needs it. <laughs> like if it would have been us, we wouldn't have been like, the Lord needs it. We would have been all like shy and kind of unsure. Like the Lord needs it. What'd you say? The Lord needs it. Like, there's no way this is going to work. And the guys just let him steal the donkey. Like, this is one of those wonderful lessons. I don't know if you guys live with this principle, but I've always lived with the thought of just go until someone says no. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, I walk in all kinds of places I'm never supposed to be. I'll walk backstage at concerts. I have no passes. Just I'm just walking. Like, like what's up? You get in all kinds of places when you do that. You all know that, right? I teach you a trick. You can get in it just about anywhere to do anything. I was breaking into hospitals during COVID to pray for people. Like, yeah, it's cool. I got some credentials. You just don't let people stop and ask. And then when you do, you say, the Lord needs it. It's Jesus' fault. The Lord needs me backstage. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. So the owners confront him like, hey, you're stealing our donkey. It's a brand new donkey. Nobody's ever ridden that donkey. And they're like, it's cool because Jesus needs it. And so they steal the donkey and they bring it to Jesus and they throw their garments over him to ride on. And as he rides along, the crowd spreads out their garments on the road ahead. Now, if you just read the account in Luke, you just think it's a kind of maybe a group of people. But if you jump over to John 12, the Bible tells us in verse 12 that the news of Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem, swept through the entire city, and this large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and they go down the road to meet him. So now we learn, of course, that this is Passover time. Passover is one of the major festivals where people would come to Jerusalem, and during Passover, there'd be nearly a million people in Jerusalem, which is a city of maybe 100,000-ish at this time. 
So it's kind of like when you go down to Gulf Shores or Destin in the middle of spring break, and it's just a disaster. Like it's a town that's really set up for like 20,000 people. And then all these people from Fisher show up and they just totally crowd the streets and you can't drive anywhere. Gatlinburg, Tennessee. We went to Gatlinburg one time. I was like, why does anyone come here? You can't drive in or out of the city. We spent the entire spring break in the car trying to just go to lunch. It was so frustrating. Well, that's how Jerusalem would have been, just slammed with people, overloaded. And so this crowd probably was thousands of people who were coming out now to meet Jesus. And we pick up this little detail of why we call it Palm Sunday. They're bringing these palm branches with them. Well, palm branches to the nation of Israel symbolize victory and deliverance. It was actually directly connected to a different festival called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And maybe you've never studied this before, but there are several different significant things that God would have the nation of Israel do to remind them of how he had helped them and how he had set them free and how he had prospered them. Because the truth is the, the greatest enemy of all of our faith is our forgetfulness. The reality is God has been good to every one of us. If you are breathing air today, you are blessed because God Almighty put that breath in your lungs and let you wake up this morning. Not to mention the fact that all of us have a roof over our heads and whether we like it or not, we have a car that we drove to church today and then we have the gall to tell God, you've never done anything for me. My life is not blessed and I'm so frustrated and things are so hard and God has forsaken me and all of that's crazy if we just remember the good things that God has done for us. And so God knows that human tendency. It's why he gave us communion, which we'll be taking at Easter. It's why he put these feasts and festivals in place for the nation of Israel. Well, the Feast of Booths or the Feast of the Tabernacle is, if you want to read about it, is in Leviticus 23. And they were required to take these palm branches and other types of tree limbs and build a hut out in the desert. And then they had to go live in those man-made huts for a week to celebrate the victory that God had given them over Egypt. Now, how many of y'all get frustrated from time to time with your house? Come on, honest people in the house, every campus, show of hands. Liars, you were all liars. People are like, I'm not frustrated ever. No, every, I'm, I don't know about you, but houses are just meant to fall apart. You know what I'm talking about? When you become a homeowner, you have to learn all kinds of dumb stuff. Like, why does every spigot break every year? I always do what I'm supposed to do. And then we get to the spring and it's pouring water into the crawl space. What is wrong with life? Like you, hot water heater goes out and the furnace breaks and the roof leaks. And it's always something. If you're a homeowner, you know what I'm talking about. It's always something. But if the Lord made us go live in a hut for seven days that we built ourselves, we'd probably stop complaining about all the frustrating things that are happening in the home that we have. We'd kiss the ground when we got home. We'd say, thank God he has been so good and so faithful. I am blessed beyond measure. Praise the Lord that everything good in my life comes from God. And I'm not a slave in Egypt anymore. And I don't have to live in some stupid hut. Praise God for that. Now, look, I've been gone for a couple of weeks, but y'all turned into a Lutheran church while I was gone. I don't know what <laughs> happened, but y'all a little sleepy today, so we're going to need to get the caffeine up. So they had this festival where they're living in these huts because the palm branch celebrates victory. And now they would use it generations later to also honor a conquering king. So this is what's happening on Palm Sunday. They're celebrating some type of victory. They think victory over the Romans. They believe that Jesus is the prophesied king that will set them free and establish an independent nation of Israel ruling the world from Jerusalem fulfilling prophecy. Verse 37, when he reached the place where the road started down to the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles that they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. Now, his disciples are a little bit confused. And I, I always were frustrated with the fact that they didn't get that, like Jesus told them so many times, I'm going to die and then come back to life. I'm going to die. My kingdom is not of this world. I'm not trying to establish a physical kingdom. It's like, why could they never understand? Well, 
I read this prophecy this week that Jesus is actually fulfilling where we started the message and it shed a little light on to why it could be confusing. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, we read a moment ago, it says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. They're watching this unfold. This is the prophecy. Well, look at the second half of the prophecy. Verse 10, I will remove battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle and your king will bring peace to the nations. His realm will stretch from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. So this is prophetically speaking about how Jesus will come once again, as we know at the end of time, and rule and reign from Jerusalem over all of planet earth where we will have never ending peace. But see, the disciples believed that that was in that moment. They believed that Jesus was getting ready to lead a revolution. They thought, I, I, you know, maybe these people that are laying the palm branches will turn into an army and we're about to bum rush the capital and take over Rome. They don't know. Maybe angels are about to appear in the sky and, and strike all the Roman soldiers dead. But in their heart, they're like, I know the prophecy because these young men, of course, were raised in Jewish culture. They knew the prophecies. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the law. They knew exactly who Jesus was. They believed that he was the Messiah. And it was prophesied that not only would he come on a donkey, but that he would establish his government and create peace in the world and that all of these weapons of war would be removed from Jerusalem. Now, the Bible tells us that their understanding of these events were clouded, that they were flawed, their judgment was flawed, that they were unable to comprehend or see. And we know that. We know that they still didn't believe in the fact that Jesus was going to die and be raised to life because exactly zero people were present on Resurrection Sunday. Jesus said, they're going to kill me on a cross and then I'll come to life three days later. And instead of being there, like anticipating he's coming back, just like he said, no, they were all hiding and scared. And so in this moment, they're, they're confused. They, they're thinking that, man, this revolution is about to break out and, and things are getting ready to take place. But what they didn't understand was the, the donkey had a much deeper meaning. You see, when kings would ride into a city on a horse, it was to declare war. But when kings would ride into a city on a donkey, they were coming to declare peace. And so jot this down if you're taking notes. Jesus was not declaring war between the Jews and the Romans. He was declaring peace between God and man. What Jesus was doing that day is prophetically speaking to the fact that he was about to give his life in your place and in my place so that you and I could be reconciled to God. And the people who were celebrating Jesus on Palm Sunday thought that they were celebrating a conquering king coming to free them from a political oppressor. But what they were actually celebrating was the king of all kings coming to free us from the debt of sin that we could never pay in this life. Praise God that he won the bigger battle. They were celebrating the ultimate victory over death, hell, and the grave, and they didn't even know what they were a part of. Jesus was getting ready to reconcile the world to himself, and he made this entire statement on a donkey. Certainly not the way that you or I would enter a city. I, I don't know about you, but if I was the creator of the universe and I came into the city knowing that I'm getting ready to give my life and to declare my kingship, whether it's politically or spiritually or anything else, I would have been like King Ali Ababwa. You know what I'm saying? Like I would have gotten camels and probably, a, a, you know, some lions dancing around. I probably would have been riding an elephant or maybe a horse or in a chariot. And that's honestly how the political kings came into the city. Pilate would have come to the city. Caesar would have come to the city. These role players that we find in the story, they would have arrived that week as well. And they would have arrived just as you or I would have wanted to arrive as a celebrated king. But Jesus came humbly riding on a donkey and not just any donkey. It was a borrowed donkey. I love the fact, I don't know if you realize this, but do you know that Jesus was a prolific borrower of things? 
He loved borrowing things. Y'all know those people who like to borrow things. Maybe you have a neighbor like that. They open their garage and you see yours inside. Like, that's my lawnmower. And I really like to have my ladder back. And I'm pretty sure they got my wrench too. <laughs> well, this will blow your mind. That was Jesus. Jesus borrowed stuff all the time. He borrowed a manger to enter the world. He borrowed somebody's boat so he could preach to the masses. He borrowed a lunch so he could feed a crowd. He borrowed a donkey to enter Jerusalem. He borrowed a room for his last supper. And he borrowed a tomb to conquer sin. Praise God. He's a borrower. My thought for you today is I believe this Easter Jesus wants to borrow you. I believe you and I can be just like the donkey in the story because I believe God wants to use us to carry him to people and places who have yet to hear his voice and yet to know how good he is and the price that he paid. The thought I have for you today simply is if God can use a donkey, then God can use me. <laughs> and I'm thankful for that. There's three things I want you to know, and I think this will catch three different categories of people today as we look at this simple donkey. We'll spend a couple more minutes in the Word, and then we'll get you out of lunch. To be a good donkey, number one, jot it down if you're taking notes today. The first thing that you need is faithfulness, faithfulness. If you're taking notes off to the side, jot down, don't wander, don't wander. Because in verse 30, Jesus said, you're going to see this donkey tied there. That's a simple thought, but it's not fun to be tied to a post, I would imagine. I've never been an actual donkey. But I'm just, in my holy imagination, wondering about this donkey's life. He's a donkey. He's a beast of burden. He's designed to carry loads. He's designed to do work. He's created to make a difference. And I would imagine that he has that desire in his heart, as all creation does, to live out his God-given purpose. And yet day after day pass. And while other donkeys are being loaded, and while other donkeys are being used, while other donkeys are making a difference, here he sits tied to a post day after day, feeling maybe like his life doesn't matter, feeling like he's not making a difference, feeling like he's just stuck on the sidelines of life. And I bet there's some people here today that have that same feeling, God, I have more to offer. I have dreams in my heart. I feel like I have some gifts. I, I feel like there's some type of call, but for whatever reason, I feel like I'm just tied to this post. I'm stuck in a season where I'm not being able to be used and, and my gifts are kind of sidelined and I don't really understand why other people are being used and why everyone else has opportunities and why I'm just stuck here at this post. I think sometimes God takes us through seasons of preparation. I think there are seasons that he has us sit to the side while he grows our character, while he aligns things in our hearts, while he changes our perspectives, while he grows us from the inside out. And I can tell you, those are some of the most frustrating seasons in life. One of the longest one I had was when I was in college. I love March. Any March Madness fans in the house? Come on, somebody. It's, it's fantastic. Best time of year. I love basketball. I love college basketball. And uh, man, Creighton was just killing me last night. Just win already. It's like one o'clock in the morning, double overtime. They kept not scoring. Like just make, I don't care who wins, just somebody end this for crying out loud. I got to preach in like two hours. It's ridiculous. <laughs> just the devil keeping me awake. And then like they, it wasn't even fun when they won. They won by like 10 points. It was like, now this is boring. I watched this whole time for a blowout in overtime. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, it's not the point. You're distracting me. <laughs> the point is, I, I love college basketball because I, I got to kind of sort of play college basketball. I was at Old Roberts University for five years with a uniform sitting on the bench, just loving every minute of it. Not at all. I was so frustrated because I felt like I had gifts. I felt like I had abilities. I played great in practice. I was great on the scout team. I'd score a lot in scrimmages. And yet game after game after game, season after season after season, coach after coach after coach, I just sat there. And I ended up being there for five years because I, I had a 
medical redshirt year from tearing my ACL. And I felt like I had so much to offer that I could make a difference. God, if I could just, if you just let me into the game, if I could just play a little bit, then, then people would care and I'd be able to share my testimony and I, I'd be able to make a bigger difference for you. And man, I was so frustrated because every year I played less and I played less my senior year than I did my freshman year. And I really, I had my own chair picked out, man. I knew, I knew I had my flow. I was just a practice team dude. And it was frustrating because that wasn't my heart. I wanted to play. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to be on the court to the point that I really wrestled with the Lord of like, let me transfer, get me out of this dumb college. Let me go play somewhere else. I'll play D2. I'll go to an NAI school. I don't care, whatever. Just, I would like to just be able to actually touch a basketball while the clock is running. How about that? That'd be amazing. And I just never felt a release. I never felt like God would let me go. And I couldn't figure out why until years and years later. Y'all know how that happens. Like your life doesn't make sense until you get like two decades removed. And then you look back and go, oh, that's, how about that? <laughs> and I can promise you that Itown wouldn't be the church it is today had it not been for me stuck, tied to a post at Oral Roberts University because four or five of the senior pastors that I'm close friends with were either on the basketball team or at the school at that time. And there was one connection with one person in particular that connected me to Pastor Chris Hodges, who wasn't even a part of the basketball program, but happened to be a classmate of mine while I was at Oral Roberts University. Literally, nearly everything that we are doing today is connected to the fact that I was stuck at that dumb school, sitting the bench for five years. It was frustrating. I felt like I had more to offer, but then I looked back and I learned how my character had to grow and I had to learn how to submit to leadership and I had to discipline my body and I had to learn how to be bold in my faith. And we started Bible studies in our room and we saw revival on the team and God started to move in incredible ways that wouldn't have happened had I not just been stuck in the season that I was in. And I know my story is not your story, but we all can glean from Luke chapter 16 that if you are faithful in little things, then you will be faithful in the large ones. And I just want you to know the world doesn't work the way we want it to work. Everybody wants a platform and a microphone. Everybody wants the big house. Everybody wants the dream job. Everybody wants the visibility, but nobody wants to be tied to a post for years at a time. Nobody wants the season of preparation, the season where you're just doing the small things, where you're just faithful with what God's put in front of you. And I just worry that we've got a generation wandering from their posts and had the donkey figured out a way to get untied and wander away to go make himself useful. He never would have been used by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on one of the most significant days in human history to announce that sin was going to be paid for and that he would conquer the greatest adversary of humanity for all time. Tied to a post, stuck. Your post does not limit your potential. Just because you're stuck in a season where you feel like you're not being used doesn't mean that you're not gonna live a life that will make a difference. I'm telling you, keep going to class and be faithful to get good grades. Keep changing those baby diapers. Keep showing up to that job on time that you feel like is beneath your potential because God definitely has something for you. You just have to be faithful with the things that he has given you. And when you're faithful with little, then God can give you more. I think about David. I love studying his life because Saul, of course, is filled with pride and disqualifies himself from kingship. And the prophet comes and anoints David as the next king over Israel. But the next step is not that he goes to live in the palace. It's not that he has tremendous influence. He gets sent back to shepherding sheep, which was the lowliest job that you could possibly have. In Jewish culture, you would not even let a family member be a shepherd because the shepherds were literally the most disgusting outcasts in culture, and yet David is the youngest son of Jesse, is in the field, just watching sheep. I can't imagine that he enjoyed that season. It had to have been frustrating, feeling like, man, I've got the potential to be this great worshiper. I love the Lord with all of my heart, and I know that I'm bold and strong and a warrior, and I've got something that God wants me to do. I've got a call in my life to lead, and here I am stuck in the middle of nowhere, completely forgotten, watching sheep while being attacked by lions and bears. 
Come on, somebody. Don't you know it? When you get to the place you feel like nobody knows what I'm doing, nobody even sees the talent in my life, nobody cares what's going on in my life. It's about the time that everything falls apart and all hell breaks loose against you and the devil tries to drown you and you think, my God in heaven, has he completely forsaken me? David, I'm sure, wasn't like, praise the Lord for these lions. This is awesome. These are great training moments. I love these bears. This is fantastic. He had to be like, are you kidding me? Again? Just send an angel or two. I thought I was supposed to be king. I thought this whole God thing, like, what is what? <sighs> Most of us would have been like, well, at least it's a sheep. Praise the Lord, the king is safe. You can have as many sheep as you want. I'm the anointed one. But David was like, no, no, he didn't. Come back here. He's running after lions and bears, killing them with his bear head. Like, how bad do you have to be? To kill wild bears and lions with your bare hands. And then he gets before the king in the moment of Goliath. He's like, oh, this is easy. He's slow compared to lions and bears. This is, this is a cakewalk, man. Now I understand. So many times we get stuck in these places that feel beneath our potential and compromise. And I just want you to know God's got something in store for your life. Philippians chapter 2 verse 17 says, I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. Do you know our faithfulness is an offering to God? Just showing up. Some of the most incredible people around here are the people that are faithful to set up the parking cones, people that are faithful to come and greet, people that are faithful to brew that coffee, people that are faithful to watch those babies back in the kids' area and share the love of Jesus with them. Come on, clap your hands for the faithfulness of the house. Praise God for people that serve week in and week out so that we can worship Jesus. So we can lift up his name. Your faithfulness is an offering and your faithfulness will always lead to significance. Be faithful. The donkey was tied to a post, not wandering from where God had stationed him. Number two is fearlessness. If you want to be a good donkey, don't waver. Don't waver. Because not to belabor the point, but go back to verse 30, it's just a young donkey. I think some of us live in fear in the first category of maybe being insignificant and not, not getting the opportunity to be used, but I think others of us live in crippling fear of being accepted. We live in a culture that bombards our minds with the idea that you are less than, that someone else is always better than you, more talented than you, taller than you, more fit than you, prettier than you, more gifted than you, more schooled than you, more spiritual than you. We live in a culture of comparison and we're suffering from an identity crisis and I just wonder if the donkey, while he's tied to the post, had some thoughts of, man, if I was a horse, I could probably make a difference with my life. If I had been born a camel, I could probably do something that would really be significant. Maybe if God could just change me into something else, if I had gifts that somebody else was given, if I had opportunities that somebody else has, if I just had someone else's life, someone else's looks, someone else's talent, someone else's ability, then I could do something special. It's so easy for us to fall into the trap of wishing that our lives look like somebody else, acted like somebody else, were gifted like somebody else, and we forget about the unique significance that God has given each and every one of us. Jesus needed and wanted a donkey that day. He didn't change him into something that the world thought was sexy in order to use him. He didn't say, look, it's cool that you're a donkey, but one day I'll make you into a horse and then I can really use you for the kingdom. No, Jesus came looking for a beast that could carry a heavy load as he was carrying the weight of the world. Jesus needed an animal that was created just for that purpose. And the donkey was exactly who Jesus needed him to be. In fact, I love... Later in verse 30, it says, if anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? You just need to say, the Lord needs it. And I want you to wake up every morning and tell yourself simply, the Lord needs me. 
The Lord needs me. The Lord needs me just the way that I am. He gave me the breath in my lungs. He gave me the talents that I have. He made me into the form, into the shape that I am. The genes, I didn't get to pick my DNA. I didn't get to pick my brain capacity. I didn't get to pick if I could sing or not. I didn't get to pick that if I could be athletic or not. I didn't get to pick any of those things. God picked them for me. And so there must be a purpose behind why he made me the way that I am. And I'm telling you, when your moment comes, and it will, you'll understand why God made you exactly the way that you are. Stop trying to be somebody else. Man, I spent so many years in ministry wishing I could preach like that guy, and I could act like that person. I could dress like that person. I could lead like that person. And man, I'd beat myself up if I, if I was just a little more detailed, if I could just be a little more strategic, if I could just be a little nicer sometimes maybe, or maybe just a little funnier. I don't know. Maybe if I was a little more spiritual, maybe if I did it like that person, then, then I would be better. Then God could really use me. Then, then I could really make a difference. But you know, I've found that there's been some times that God just needed a stubborn moron, and that was me. (laughs) Too stupid to close the doors, too stupid to say no, too dumb to pack down, too stubborn to say, no, we're not going to compromise. I'm just gonna stay the course and do what God's called me to be, and I'm just a simple donkey, but I'm thankful that God uses donkeys. Psalm 139 says, I praise you, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Listen, y'all clapped a little too loud for me being a donkey. That's right, you are stubborn and dumb. Praise God. How he fixed you, I don't know. Praise the Lord. It's like Paul, he said, if God can use me, the worst of sinners, God can use anybody. I'm serious. Fearfully and wonderfully made. You're one of a kind. God made you the way you are on purpose. Don't let the world tell you that there's something wrong with you. Now the Bible will tell you the sin that's wrong with you and every one of us have to live according to this standard. You don't get to decide that. God decides that. But we gotta quit desiring other people's gifts and other people's anointing and other people's calling and other people's talents because you don't need those. You need the gifts God has given you because it takes each one of us. The Bible says as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body of Christ is healthy and growing and full of love. And some people are really outgoing and they're wonderful. They're type A's and they love to meet everybody and they make fantastic greeters and pretty good ushers. But you guess what? They're horrible at worship guides because they'll talk the whole time and they'll mess every one of them up. Some of you are introverts and you'd rather never talk to a human again. Guess what? That's perfect. You can make a difference for Jesus stuffing worship guides and doing data entry, sitting behind the scenes. God made all of us with the different gifts that we have on purpose because it takes all these different roles. Somebody's got to go feed the children. Somebody's got to visit the prisons. Somebody's got to minister back in the kids area. Somebody's got to sit at the parking lot. Somebody's got to do the data entry. All of us need to invite our friends. Every one of us can make a difference in being a light, but we all do it in different ways and we all share equally in the reward. I don't get more reward in heaven because I had a microphone and a platform. Every person that set up every flag in the parking lot gets credit for every single person that gets saved today just as equally as I do because we're all in this together. We all have our different roles. We all get to serve in different ways, but we're a team. Faithfulness. Fearlessness. The last one is fruitfulness. Some of us are waiting. Don't wait. Don't wait. Some of you feel like you're overprepared and on the sidelines, but I wonder how many feel underprepared and are on the sidelines because this donkey, remember, was one that no one had ever ridden. I wonder if the donkey wrestled with, man, I just, I've never had anything on my back before, so I'll pass on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Kind of a big moment. I'm a little inexperienced. I don't feel like I got the degree for that. But the thing that's fascinating is it's what actually qualified him for a king to ride him. 
It's fascinating to me how so many times the things that we feel disqualify us are the very things that God uses to qualify us so that we can make a difference in the world around us. And some of us are thinking, man, I just, I don't know that I can share my faith. I don't really know that I know enough of the Bible. I don't know that I could argue with someone. Listen, you don't need to argue about your faith. All you got to do, the Bible says they overcame the enemy in Revelation by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. The blood of the lamb is what Jesus has done. He died in our place so that we could be forgiven and set free. You can't earn your way to God. That's the good news of the gospel. It's free to everyone. It's by grace that we are saved. But then your testimony is just, and guess what it did for me? I once was broken and now I'm whole. I used to be addicted and now I'm set free. I used to be a jerk and now I'm less of a jerk. I used to do these things and now I don't. I once was blind, but now I see. I used to be far from God, but now I experience his presence and his power. And if he did it for me, I know that he can do it for you. It's the power of a changed life. You don't have to be a theologian to make a difference in the world around you. I love the story of the woman at the well. Jesus was not supposed to be talking to this woman because men didn't talk to women in that culture. And she was a Samaritan, which was considered less than a human. I love how Jesus just broke through all kinds of controversial boundaries racially and ethnically and, and all these things just to minister to love on people. And he's speaking to this woman and her life is a mess. She'd been through a bunch of different husbands and the guy she's sleeping with wasn't her husband. And in today's culture, we call that pretty normal. But in that culture, it was like, can't even, people can't even fathom that this is public knowledge. And in the midst of all of that, she leaves that moment and runs back to the village and grabs everybody she knows. And she says, come see the man that told me everything I've ever done. She created a revival within moments of having her own revival. In moments of meeting Jesus, she's bringing people to Jesus because found people find people. That's what they do. We should be on fire the moment that we know that we don't have to pay the price for our own sins. We should be so fired up about it that we want to go tell everybody that we possibly can about the Jesus who rescued us and saved us and changed us. And that's what it means to be a donkey, just to carry Jesus back into the world that so desperately needs to hear the hope that we have in Jesus. It's not complicated. It's just as simple as, hey, I'm going to Easter. I'm going to go to the 7 o'clock service on Thursday night. I'm going to the 9 o'clock service at Mudsock. I would love for you to come and sit with me. Because listen, I love feeding children. I love preaching on television. I love all the things that we do, the billboards that we bought. But very few people are coming because of those things. Those are just reinforcers to when you say, would you come with me to that? It's the personal invitation that makes the difference. And I'm just telling you, if everybody here goes and finds at least one person and brings one person to Easter... We will see revival in this city. We will see hundreds of people saved. And Easter will be what Easter is about. I once was dead, but now I have been brought to new life in Christ. I once was lost, but now I'm found. It's the miracle of the gospel. It's what Resurrection Sunday is about. It's about those that are hurting and broken, who think that they'll never be good enough hearing the message that Jesus died in their place so they could be forgiven and set free. And I don't know what it is about Easter, but there's something about that holiday like Christmas that people will just say yes. I believe God wants to use us. Be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And when he prompts you, take one of those invite cards and invite people. Hey, come sit with me. Let's go to Easter together. My promise to you, as we always do, is we won't water this thing down. We'll have the power of God. The presence of the Holy Spirit will be in this place. We will take communion together as a church, and we will preach the gospel unashamed. Jesus will be lifted up, and the Bible says if he is lifted up, that he would draw people to himself. And I promise you, we will make a difference. If God can use a donkey, then God can use me. I think this Easter, Jesus wants to borrow each and every one of us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to pray that God would lead us throughout the week, that we'd be spirit-led in our conversations with our neighbors, our coworkers, our classmates, the people that are in our sphere of influence, that we'd be able to leverage what God has given us to make a difference. 
that just like the donkey, we'd be in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing, faithful in the little, positioned to do what he's called us to do. But before we pray for that, I just wonder how many people are here at one of our campuses today, maybe watching online or at a correctional facility. And for whatever reason, you're far from God. I want you to know that God loves you more than you could possibly imagine. You don't have to wait until Resurrection Sunday to experience resurrection power. God wants to touch you today. You can leave here with your whole life being transformed. It's a miracle called salvation. We surrender control of our lives to the Lord. The Bible tells us that he makes us into a brand new person changing us from the inside out, giving us a whole new trajectory to life. That miracle can be yours today just by saying yes to Jesus in a simple prayer. I'm not going to make you stand or come to the front. Campus pastors are joining me on the stage at the campuses, and we're each going to pray with you. Maybe that's you today. If you're far from God, you know it in your heart. The Holy Spirit is messing with you right now. You can feel it in your stomach. This is your moment. God is welcoming you, inviting you to come home to the family of God. It's time to pray just a simple prayer to make him Lord. If that's you and no one looking around, I would love for you just to lift your hand up high for just a minute to say, Dave, that's me. I'm ready to make that decision. I need to give Jesus my life today. Come on right now. Just put your hand up high all across the room and in every room today. Come on, take a minute. Be bold. Put your hand up high. Say, that's me. I need to make a decision for Jesus. I'm ready to surrender to him. Awesome. Awesome. Proud of you. You can put your hands down if you haven't already. Here's what we'll do. I'm going to lead you in this simple prayer. You can pray it quietly in your heart. You just need to mean it. Just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me today. For all of my sin, I repent. Now just tell him, I surrender to you and I make you my Lord. Holy Spirit, I invite you into my life to fill me, to guide me, help me to follow you. Then just whisper to heaven, just say, Lord, I give you my life. I give you my life in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for this incredible church, for the difference that you've called us to make this Easter, God. We thank you that you can use us just like the faithful donkey. We celebrate the gifts that you have given us and the uniqueness that we have. And God, no matter how overqualified or underqualified we feel, we thank you that we were born for such a time as this. We pray that you would help us to come together as the body of Christ this Easter, not just to celebrate our risen King, but to help people that we love experience resurrection power. Holy Spirit, be with us. Lead us and guide us. Let us keep in step with you in every conversation we have all week long. We thank you that as we bring guests with us into the service, that the presence of God will fill this place and that your power would touch them and that they'd leave here healed and restored and transformed by your power. God, I pray that same thing over your people today in every area of life where they are struggling and suffering. We thank you that the power of God is touching them in each and every way. One more time, we say thank you that you're better to us than we deserve. We love you today. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said amen. Amen. Come on, church, help me celebrate with those who prayed that prayer today. Thank you so much for joining iTown Church online today. We would love to have the chance to meet you and your family in person at one of our campuses. Or, of course, you can join us streaming live online this weekend. Now, for more details about times and locations and even some of our streaming options, you can go to itownchurch.com. I sure hope to see you soon, and God bless.